Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Kelly Olson from the University of Western Ontario. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about clothing and appearance in ancient Rome. All right, so here we go. And this is a one of the ongoing series of lectures from the Classical Association of Canada on our YouTube channel. So do check out the other ones. They're all super interesting. With 7 billion people in the world, the one thing we all have in common is that every day we all get dressed. That's from the introduction to a popular podcast on fashion history, but it is true. Clothing is an important, intimate record of human experience and has been used in various societies to mark age, gender, sexuality, social rank, social status, political prerogative, and as a creator of social position, and in addition, as an important tool of social regulation. And the ancient Romans, as we will see, were no exception to this general rule. So first, we're going to look a little bit at men's clothing. The Romans attached great importance to distinctions in dress, which for them were supposed to visualize the social hierarchy. So men of all to men of all ages and ranks um, wore the tunic seen here, and the citizens wore over top this the toga. The tunic was just a short woolen undergarment with short sleeves. Um, it has a it's a kind of skirted garment, and really everybody in um, ancient society wears a tunic, whether you're slave or female or male or a child, you all wear the basic tunic. Um, to wear a tunic with a long tunic with long sleeves like this one here was considered effeminate and was generally avoided by men in Roman society as a whole. Um, as the toga was specifically meant as a public display garment, the tunic was worn by people within the comforts of their own homes. The tunic worn by upper class men or wealthy men was made from very expensive white wool or linen while the poor would wear whatever fabric was readily available um, or purchase their tunic secondhand from the secondhand clothing dealers called the Kentonarii. Um, generally speaking, every piece of clothing in the ancient world is woven to shape. You, um, there's no ready-made clothing. Uh, you have to either have it woven to shape or buy it secondhand. Uh, all right, and here is a reproduction of a Roman relief showing the butcher and his wife. Uh, and the man is in a tunic. So this is what I mean when I say a, a kind of skirted garment. All right, so that's our tunic. Um, the woman is also wearing a tunic. So everybody wears the tunic in Roman society. The toga, by contrast, is a large cumbersome, cumbersome robe-like uh, garment of uh, wool of varying shades. And in the Augustan era, that is the first century CE, it could use up to nine yards of material. So it could be very cumbersome and very uncomfortable. Only citizens had the right to wear the toga, and there were specific types meant to designate positions and situations. And I'll talk about senatorial togas in a minute. Um, styles in the width and draping of the toga also changed down through the centuries of Rome's empire. So this is a very early Republican toga. Um, it's not very elaborately draped. Um, dates from about 100 um, or so. And by contrast, this is a much later um, toga of the Augustan era. Um, with its, its long curving um, uh, piece right here. The toga is much more voluminous in this period. Uh, there's a lot more material that's used in it. Um, there were very senatorial signs which were specifically meant to designate each order. A senator that is um, of the senatorial classes, a magistrate holding political office was recognizable by the two wide stripes on his tunic called Lati Klawi and by his purple bordered toga called the toga praetexta. And this border is on the upper edge of the toga um, as we'll see in just a minute. Um, he also wore special shoes, shoe boots called calque and they were either black or red if he was um, a very patrician status. So calque or black or red um, shoe boots. We think of the Romans as always wearing sandals but they do occasionally um, if they're of the upper classes uh, wear shoe boots as well. Uh, all right, so this shows um, a tunic with two narrow stripes on it. Um, this man is uh, um, not a senator or probably not even a member of Rome's business class. By the second century, most people were wearing some sort of stripes um, on their tunic, as our ancient authors complain um, very loudly. 
Um, this is a mosaic of uh, the writer Virgil um, in a striped tunic. Um, you can see the narrow stripe there. Um, as he is of Rome's business class. And this is a great um, example of the border toga. So this man is wearing the wide stripe on his tunic. So that's a latus clawis, and there's the border of the toga praetexta. So it actually goes around the top of the toga, not the bottom of the toga, as we're sometimes led to believe. Um, so the, that's what a Roman senator wears. The equites or the knights, as I mentioned, have the narrow stripes on their tunic. And free poor men do wear a toga, but they wear just a plain toga, an unbordered toga. Perhaps it was rather short or scanty, depending on their financial, um, their, uh, financial means. Um, the toga is a symbol of Roman citizenship. Uh, men who were canvassing for office wore a toga artificially whitened with chalk, the toga candidus, which is where our own word candidate comes from. Um, some men of the poorer classes uh, couldn't afford togas. Uh, they are very expensive. And so sometimes we see um, uh, our artistic examples of uh, men who are of the working classes just wearing a tunic. Um, however, you have to be careful because if you go out of your house dressed only in a tunic, there is a chance you'll be mistaken for a slave because only citizen males um, uh, have the right to wear the toga and a couple of other classes as well. So you have to be careful. Um, even free citizen boys are supposed to visualize their status um, by wearing a toga uh, that's bordered, the toga praetexta. So it's magistrates and free citizen boys and girls who wear that border toga. And free citizen boys in addition wear a bulla or an amulet. Bulla is the Latin word for bubble. Um, and I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. So this is a funerary relief of a free citizen boy um, wearing the toga uh, there, as you can see. And in this procession on the south side of the Arapacus, we have all the children in togas, even the girl here. And then if you look closely, you can see the bulli, the little amulets hanging around the necklace, the uh, boy's um, necks. So everyone in Roman society is supposed to visualize their social um, rank in these ways. Slaves don't have any clothing specific to slavery. Um, they often wear shabby clothing appropriate to their low station in life, and they are not allowed to wear the toga. So this is a rather late um, example, but slaves often are um, just wearing the tunic, sometimes a loincloth, depending on where, um, where they work. So while there was no established legal hierarchy of clothing, in other words, you can't be sued if you wear a toga when you're not allowed to wear a toga, there was, however, a system of sartorial signs in ancient Roman society, which was unofficial, understood, um, and acknowledged. However, stating juridical position was not clothing's sole function in antiquity. Aspects of appearance also conceptualize social status so rather than juridical rank, status has to do with wealth and power um, within your own um, class. Um, a man may not have been legally entitled to wear the broad striped tunic, for instance, um, with the, the purple stripes, um, which are very expensive, by the way. But he could certainly demonstrate financial status by other uses of purple on his clothing or gems on his fingers. Such indicators helped in the recognition of one's peers and superiors, as well of those of lower social station. So clothing has not only a strong um, sort of juridical, but also a very strong social dimension. It's a very important way in which our symbol conscious Romans demonstrated rank and status. Uh, okay, so now we're, that's male clothing generally, um, and a little bit on the clothing of children. And now we're going to go on to women's clothing. Uh, a few ancient authors describe the ideal costume of the Roman matron, and this is a costume which is supposed to indicate her sexual status, so her sanctity and her family honor, and the fact that she's legitimately married. So part of her costume is the paula. This is a, um, uh, a long cloak or mantle used by the matron to cover her head um, ideally when she went out in public. So women also wear a long tunic and you can see the edge of the tunic here um, falling at the woman's feet. And then she has a very long voluminous paula, um, a cloak or mantle, which ideally the woman is supposed to cover her head with when she goes out in public. 
um, veiling signified her modesty and chastity and was supposed to protect her from improper advances. Um, veiling was thought to be a way for women to avoid the male gaze and the ensuing solicitations. And we do have um, statues and busts of women with veiled heads. Um, however, we have a lot more artistic examples of women who are not veiled, and I have some of those coming up. Um, the other part of our, our uh, ideal matron's costume is the stola. The stola is a long slip-like garment suspended from shoulder straps and it's worn over the tunic. It's a kind of extra layer of clothing between the tunic and the paula. And it was also a mark of social status, um, possibly of social rank, although scholars are um, not quite agreed on that. So freed women, that is freed slave women married to Roman citizens were granted the right to wear the stola um, ostensibly in the third century BCE. All right, so there's our there's the stola. You can always identify the stola in statuary um, by the um, the little um, strap that hangs over the shoulder. Interestingly, in many portraits, you can't tell if the woman's wearing a stola because the straps are covered up by the paula. So that's kind of um, fascinating. Um, despite the fact that very few women wear the stola and the paula in the artistic record. The combination of the stola and the paula and the long tunic are nonetheless closely linked with the honorable married women in Roman literature. We find that again and again and again. Um, how else was female rank and status made known in Roman society? Through other aspects of their appearance, like the color and fabric of their clothing. That's mainly how they did it, as well as jewelry, um, which I'm not covering today because I don't have enough time. Uh, there was actually great sophistication in ancient Rome um, around the use of dyes and luxury fabrics for status display, and women's clothing partic partook of an array of colors far more than the clothing of men did. Um, so men were supposed to dress very drably in undyed um, tunics and togas, whereas women have the entire rainbow at their disposal um, for the colors uh, of their clothing. And our sources mention pink and blue, green, yellow, pale brown, dusty rose, all the colors that you can think of. Um, the Roman woman, depending on her wealth, also had a large choice of fabrics for her clothing. Um, silk was very popular, um, either interwoven with cotton or linen to keep the cost down, um, or a transparent fabric called Cohen silk. Um, which we're not really sure if it was transparent or just very thin as the way silk is. Um, and the fabric uh, worn by a woman could be embroidered with colored threads or with gold wire. So it could be um, very fancy indeed. So we don't have any actual examples of ancient Roman clothing left for us, which makes it very frustrating to be a clothing historian, but we do have some hints in our um, ancient art. So this is a statue of Minerva from Italy um, in Rome in the Piazza de, de Campidoglio. And the um, goddess has actually been given clothing um, of a different marble. So that's not painted, that's purple porphyry. And that gives you maybe an example of the different colors women could wear for their clothing. Um, Roman wall painting also gives us an indication of the colors of Roman clothing. So we have yellow and blue um, and beige um, and some yellow in this, in this um, picture. Um, and really, once you have read enough on um, ancient Roman clothing, you realize that far from being a city of white buildings and white statuary filled with people dressed in white clothing, ancient Rome probably looked an awful lot more like this. So it was a very brightly colored place, at least in terms of women's clothing. All right, women also wore cosmetics in ancient, um, in, in ancient Rome. A pale complexion was sought by women for various reasons. It's a sign of social status, a sign that you don't have to be outside working. And to achieve it, Roman women, um, according to our male authors anyway, plastered their faces with a number of different ingredients, chalk dust, um, but more seriously lead, white lead. And this is white lead that you see here. Um, those women who plastered with chalk dust or lead were warned by authors to keep out of the rain, lest their makeup streak, and also to avoid the sun because sweat would likewise ruin the mask. Similarly, women were supposed to avoid shedding tears while being made up. 
Uh, different substances, oh, and here's a cosmetic box. I couldn't find an ancient Roman one, but this is an ancient Egyptian cosmetic box um, with a mirror here and some cosmetic bowls there. Uh, different substances were used to outline and enhance brows and eyes. Uh, the, one of the interesting things about Roman cosmetics is that there's no substances that you can buy in antiquity, which are purely used as cosmetics. So there's no equivalent of Shoppers Drug Mart where you can go buy eyeshadow or eyeliner. All the substances that women are using on their faces are kind of naturally occurring organic substances which have other uses. Uh, they use coal to outline their eyes and to um, fill in their eyebrows. Coal is composed of soot um, or lamp black mixed with olive oil applied with a thin stick or a needle. And here's a coal stick down here. Um, usually it was sold as far as we can tell in powdered form and remains of coal are sometimes found in cylindrical cosmetics tubes, which tend to be double um, barreled as here or even quadruple barreled, um, sometimes for different colors. And we have remains of black coal and green coal from antiquity. Um, and there's the little handle that goes over the top. So the problem with cosmetics in antiquity is that many of them were also poisonous. White lead, of course, was especially dangerous because it could easily be swallowed. And as a result of the application of white lead, skin probably soon lost its youthful tone. Um, in fact, white lead is used as a cosmetic product all the way up until the late 18th century, even though women know that it's, it's poisonous. It just produces such a wonderful um, white um, blemish-free complexion that they keep using it. So in 18th century England, very few beauties kept their looks beyond 30 as a result of the terrific ravages of cosmetic poisons. We read from that century that skins became scarred, sallow, and spotted. Beauty could even bring about an early death, as in the case of Maria Gunning here, who overdid the white light cosmetics and um, perished when she was not even 30. So cosmetics in ancient Rome both contributed to and skillfully concealed the devastation of the complexion. So you, you um, put white lead on your face because your skin has become um, sort of pitted by the constant application of white lead. So it's a kind of vicious cycle for women. Um, we do have portraits of women um, from antiquity and it doesn't actually look to me like they're wearing very artificial makeup. So either the ancient authors are exaggerating or these women are not wearing any makeup at all. And I haven't really figured out um, what, um, what is the true um, state of affairs. All right. And finally, I'll just talk briefly about hair. And I love ancient Roman hair because they do come up with so many crazy hairstyles for women. And we're just going to see a couple of them. Um, Roman women wore various hairstyles over the course of Roman history. Some of them were really spectacular, like this one. This is from the early second century um, called the Busta Fonseca, um, now in Rome. And these high rolls of hair may have been arranged over padding to give a fuller effect, um, greased with animal fat to hold the style. Of course, there's no hairspray back then. Um, they almost certainly utilized hair, hair pieces and curling tongs for extra impressiveness. Possibly the hairstyles were held in place by a wire frame. Um, the newest thinking on these hairstyles um, uh, put forth by Janet Stevens, who is a hair archeologist, is that Roman women physically stitched their hair together. So th this um, piece of the hair um, on the head is shorter and these curls, the, the, the pieces of hair curl and they're actually stitched to one another. And she's reconstructed these hairstyles on her YouTube channel. Um, so of course this very complex hairstyles, uh, hairdressing would only have been accessible to the upper classes. So a hairstyle like this one would have meant a long commitment of time and a very skilled hairdresser to produce such an ornate hairstyle. You can't do this by yourself. You have to have um, slave help. So elaborately styled hair was a sign of social rank and social power and marked the woman of a lady of standing. Um, by contrast, funerary reliefs of lower class women show far simpler hairstyles, normally with the hair just drawn back and put into a bun, although I don't have any for you um, today. In addition, we also know that women in ancient Rome used hair dyes of various colors. And this is a twist of hair found in a Roman grave at York um, dating from the third to the fourth centuries. And chemical analysis has determined that 
the hair was coated with hair dye. So this is a chunk of false hair or a hair piece used by the owner of the grave, um, which had been dyed. We also have a couple of archaeological examples, um, like this beautiful golden hairnet, um, which we saw on the so-called Sappho portrait from Pompeii. Um, so these again are, th this would be a very um, high class um, ornament for the hair, a very expensive ornament. And we do have Roman hairpins of all shapes, sizes, materials, and various degrees of ornateness, since that's how women put their hair up. There are no bobby pins or barrettes in antiquity, so they twist their hair and stick, it, uh, stick a pin in it. Um, so we do have lots and lots of um, hairpins. So I hope today that I have um, given you some idea of the um, importance of appearance and self-presentation in ancient Rome and that you've come away with some idea of how women and men um, presented themselves in classical Roman antiquity. So thanks very much.